IPE simulation rules. Purpose. The purpose of the simulation is to educate students in the dynamics of international political economy, specifically the interaction between political structures and trade. Summary. The game depends on the sequential turn-based input of economic and political values in a shared online Google Numbers or Excel file. Students interact both domestically and internationally, voting in leaders as representatives of coalitions and engaging in international trade. Winning. Individual and states each win by amassing the greatest amount of wealth measured in points. Game components. There are 10 states, numbered 1 to 10, and 10 players in each state, numbered 1 to 10. And each player possesses a single endowment factor designated by a letter, A to E. The number of wealth point numbers ranges from zero and has no upper limit. Although at the beginning of a turn, no player can drop below having one point. So if the player has zero points, they're awarded a free extra point. Player assignment. Students are assigned randomly to citizenship positions starting with state one and player one, and so on until all the positions are filled. The remaining state will have players playing multiple citizens because you, in all likelihood, will not have 10 players for that one state. And so the remaining available positions will be randomly distributed among the remaining players of that state. Play is conducted through a sequence of steps. Each step must be completed before proceed proceeding on to the next step in order for the play to occur. There are a total of 13 steps. Now play is conducted on a Google Sheet, which is visible here. Countries are color-coded from yellow, green, brown, light blue, purple, leaf green, white, dark brown, red, and dark blue. And these are visible in many of the columns. Players are indicated by numbers from 1 to 10 and typically occupy positions along a row and are numbered 1 to 10. Player endowment factors, which means different parts of the economy, are lettered A through E and represent different sectors of the economy, very often which are competing. So in every country, you'll have two players with endowment factor A, two with B, two with C, two with D, and two with E. Every turn, the resulting inputs from the players are copy and pasted to the next column. And if you see here, you'll see three columns. The leftmost column is turn zero, the middle column is turn one, and the rightmost column is turn two. For turns three and any subsequent turns, turn two will be copy and then pasted to the right. Each of these columns uses data from the immediate left column. So only input data in the column in which the turn it is. The game will begin on turn zero with the leftmost column. Now there are different parts of this column. In the leftmost column at the top, you have a rectangular table with multiple colors with citizen written to the left of it. If you cross-reference the identity of the player, 1A, 2A, 3B, 4B, 5C, 6C, in the row with the column of the country, which is indicated by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, and which is indicated by the color as well, then you can find your particular location for the player. The number there indicates wealth points and all players begin with 10 wealth points. In the table below the black row you'll see political cis or political system. That number varies between 0 0.5 when a state is in chaos or is unable to been Un, has been unable to complete an election. One, if it's a coalition or first-past-the-post political system, or 1.1 1 
if the political system is authoritarian. Below that is the tax rate in the Burgundy Row. And this is selected by the leader and is represented by any decimal value up to one. And it indicates what proportion of the profit that each player makes is taxed and returned to the budget in the government. If you look up at the budget row, which is row 21, which is just two rows above it, you'll see a black solid state because the game starts with no leader having a budget. But these values change in turn one when the profits of the players are taxed and the values are then deposited in the budget. You can see the budget in the middle column actually has values. And here, the budget is not blacked out, and so the numbers are visible. Going back to the column on the left, you can see then tariffs from A to E, which are blue in the rectangle. And again, these are tariff rates, like the taf rate, uh, tax rates, uh, that vary between zero and any decimal value up to one. And they indicate the tariff rate against uh, imports for those specific endowments, endowment A, B, C, D, or E. Below that is the power row, which is a general measure of the total wealth of the system in the hand of the players, and it allows an assessment of the general health of the economy. Below that, on the left column, is the input rectangle. And it's indicated by a red input and domestic. Here, players will input how many points they want to allocate to domestic trade or the domestic market. And this number uh, can not exceed the total number of wealth points the student received that turn. On turn zero, the student automatically starts with 10 points. Below that, is the input export column and it's much longer and a way to situate yourself on this table is for the player first to identify their state so if the player is say yellow state one or green state two they simply find that collection of rows and there they can identify themselves such as 5c and then they can cross-reference that using color codes by looking at the columns. And so each of the columns indicates a different country they could export to in order to make a profit. In this game, it is slightly more profitable because of specialization and comparative advantage for players to trade and obtain profits from trade internationally than by engaging in trade on the domestic market. Uh, players will see blacked out columns and those are columns indicating it's their own country, and players may not export international trade logically to their own country. Some columns may also be blocked out because there's a blockade in effect determined by the leader. The next column, rather the next rectangle of data in the leftmost column is the gifts section. Here, any player may gift points to any other player, which is then uh, inserted in that player target player's uh, wealth points for the next turn. This can be useful for bribes, or for uh, tribute, uh, or for side payments, a variety of functions. Below that is the productivity section. Here, the professor will input, input the values. For every wealth point, provided by the budget of a state or by an individual player in a particular endowment, productivity increases for that particular player's return on investment using that endowment in both domestic and international trade. Here, the professor would be informed and the, um, the professor would then update the value. And so you'll see that there's a certain amount of free riding here because one player in a country can invest a lot in a particular factor, say factor A, 
and the other player would not invest anything, but they would benefit from the increased productivity. The rest of the tables are to calculate different aspects of the economy, like scarcity, profit, economy of scale, and these are not to be altered. Uh, I've left them open uh, so that students can uh, play and see how mechanically they affect uh, the output of success in the game. So let us now go through each of the steps for the uh, sequence of play. And these are visible uh, in the rules. So first it's important to determine if, if elections are required, to conduct elections, to conduct revolts, and to conduct changes of governance. And to determine if chaos is present because a particular election didn't produce a result. So in the election segment, uh, player one for each state selects a governance system at start. So this is arbitrary. The first, the player that has to be happens to be 1A will choose either authoritarianism, first past the post, or a coalition form of government. Now if player one is absent, this would fall to player two, and so on. The efficient, efficiency values for different political systems are then inputted into the gray row 22, where authoritarianism, which is the most efficient system, is 1.1 although authoritarianism is prone to corruption and to tyranny. So these are the electoral procedures. Um, uh, so for player choices, each player starts the game in possession of 10 uh, wealth points, and players may either sell it in the domestic market or export it abroad to one of the other nine states, or giving it away to any player in a state, or invest it to increase the productivity of their factor. Players are automatically awarded a single point if they begin a turn with less than one point. Players may not save unused points for the next turn points are a perishable commodity and need to be uh, invested. Now, players don't operate in a completely neutral market. There are distortions caused by tariffs, by gifting, by blockades, and so players uh, need uh, to make political choices that optimize their ability to maximize their profit. And this is where we go from uh, pol uh, an economic structure to a political economic structure and where it's demonstrated that capitalists who own factors of production have an interest in getting involved politically to alter the free market. So on the first turn, player one decides the governance system of the state, which is authoritarianism, first past the post, or coalition. Each has a different effect. In authoritarianism, the first player may elect to become a dictator. The player is free to determine the tax rate, the tariff rate. There is free discretion on spending the budget, including its appropriation for personal use. And the government system, and, and they can choose the governance system, the type of government for the next turn, which means they can continue authoritarianism. The authoritarian leader may be overthrown any time at the beginning of the next turn if seven members or 70% of the available members that are present, excluding the dictator, collectively announce that they're choosing to revolt. On a turn in which there is a revolt, all profits are cut by 50%. A new leader must be acclaimed immediately and unanimously among the revolters, or the authoritarian leader reverts back to power. So this is a very tricky system, because it can lead to incredible productivity, but also tremendous abuse, and it's very disruptive to change authoritarian leaders. The second political system is first past the post. At the beginning of every three turns, the current leader is responsible for an election in which each citizen submits a secret ballot and the winner with the plurality, in other words, the most votes, becomes the new state leader. Any tire, tie requires another election. The player is free for the next three turns to determine the tax rate, the tariff rate, free discretion on spending of the budget, including its appropriation for personal use, and the governance system for the next turn. The leader may only be, be displaced by an election result, so you can't have a revolt. The state leader may propose a change of governance system if there are six supporters or 60% of the players present for such a change. In other words, a first-past-the-post leader is a dictator for three turns and... They can always transform the political system, if they have 60% support, to an authoritarian or a coalition system. 
The third system is the coalition system. At the beginning of every three turns, the current leader is responsible for an election in which each citizen submits a secret ballot and the winner with the plurality or the most votes becomes the new state leader. Any tie requires another election. The player who won the election must determine the setting of the tax rates, tariffs, and spending of the budget in conjunction with the support of the next two runner-ups, which is the second and the third place winners in the election. And this is done for the next three turns. The leader may only be displaced by an election result. The state leader may propose a change of governance system if supported by any four coalition members. So at the conclusion of the elections, you then apply in step two the political growth multipliers. Because authoritarian states are more effective at quelling labor movements, authoritarian regimes gain a 1.1 profit multiplier. First past the post in coalitions have no effect on profits, and so they have a value of one. And political disorder resulting from a failure to obtain an election result produces a 50% loss to growth. And those values are inserted as a 0.5 in row 22. So once the government's in power, they have a number of responsibilities to set different rates. The first is setting the tax rate. The leader, uh, uh, either the authoritarian leader, or the first past the post leader, or the leader and the two runner-ups in the coalition determine the tax rate. Taxation only affects profits or returns on investment and not on base wealth, which is unassailable for all players except through class warfare. Tax rates range from 0 to 99%, represented as a decimal, 0 0.99. Tax rates apply to all players equally. The tax rate times the investment, not the profits, of the individual players uh, uh, contributes to the budget. The state's tax rate is imputed in the burgundy cell on row 23. The fourth step is to determine the tariffs. You can see it here in this square rectangle. The leader, or the first past the post uh, representative, or the leader and the two runner-ups in the coalition determine the tariff rates. Tariffs only affect profits or returns on investment and not base wealth, which is unassailable for all players except through class warfare. Tariff rates range from 0 to 99%, represented as decimals, 0 to 0.99. Tariff rates apply to specific endowments. So tariff rates must be specific with respect to which endowment they tax, whether it's A, which is agriculture and fisheries, B, minerals and energy, C, light manufacturing, D, heavy manufacturing, or E, finance and services. The tariff rate times the imports by endowment factor, not profits again, contributes to the budget. The state's tariff rates are inputted in the blue cells on rows 24 to 28. So this is done by the leader. Step five is the blocking of trade. States can specify which states are not allowed to export into their markets. So the professor would be alerted, and then the professor would block out uh, the specific column in the export block, um, which are in cells uh, 44 to 143. And this would make it clear that other players cannot allocate their points uh, into those columns for trade. Uh, attempts to trade with a state that blocks them uh, results in the investment reverting by default to domestic trade if it's caught in time. If it's not caught in time, the points are simply lost. So let's get now into the trade segment. So the tariffs, the uh, tax rate, and any blockades, as well as the political system, have been established by the leader. Now the players choose what to do with their wealth points. Players know how many wealth points they have by looking at the large rectangle, uh, second from the top, um, with the citizen indicator on the side. Uh, all players start off with 10 points. 
So the first step is to examine the budget. The budget is the sum total of the income from taxes and tariffs of the previous turn and may be spent by the leader in an authoritarian or F first past the post leader in any way chooses or by the leader and the next two electoral runner-ups in a coalition governance system. There are no um, values in the budget on turn zero because there's no previous turn in which there were uh, taxes or tariffs collected. But in turn one, you have the beginning of uh, a budget. These points may be applied in class warfare against the wealth of a player of the same state by the leader. They may be awarded to any player or players in the form of a subsidy or expropriation, or they may be invested in productivity. So the leader has a lot of power by being able to have high taxes, but some leaders may advertise themselves as being good and have low taxes. Budgets cannot be accumulated, and any amounts not used are lost in the subsequent turn. Leaders, with approval of the two runner-ups for the coalition governance system, may give points from their budget to players from other states. The state's budget for spending in any given turn is indicated and available from the white cells on row 21. In step 7, we have factor endowment indication. Players controlling endow uh, wealth points or endowment points, which begin on turn 0 at the quantity of, of 10, are indicated on rows 11 through 20 and are color coded by state with rows indicating which specific endowment, uh, A through uh, E. In subsequent turns, the impacts of other policies may increase or decrease these totals. In step 8, stu uh, players and the leader may spend uh, wealth points on productivity. Productivity is a value multiplier. You can see here way down in uh, rows 158 to uh, 162. So productivity is a value multiplier applicable to a specific endowment factor that increases its profitability in domestic and export sales. It represents levels of education and health investment and research and development that increases the added value of an industry factor. Each investment of a single point increases productivity by 1%, or decimally represented as 0 0.01, for that state for a specific endowment factor, and it's added to the base value of 1. Uh, the state's investment in productivity are inputted in the green cells on rows 158 to 162. And you can see here, what I've just highlighted are cells, two cells in which red and black, uh, countries 9 and 10, have uh, added 20 points to uh, product uh, factor A and endowment A. And you can see the values there are raised from 1.0 to 1.2, the 2 representing the uh, 20 decimal points of value added. Now the next major part of the sequence of play is the factor endowment allocations. Players may now engage in class warfare. They may now invest their factor endowment points into the domestic market or invest into interstate trade with another specific country or spend endowment points as gifts to other players. The total number of points that can be allocated to the different allocations detailed below by a player is equal to the total factor endowment um, uh, indicated in the player-specific cell in rows 11 through 20. If I find a, that a player has exceeded their um, allocated numbers, I will uh, penalize them by reducing their true value um, by the extra points that they uh, inserted. So let's get into the uh, different steps of, the, of this part of the sequence. In segment 9, there's class warfare. So if there's class warfare, uh, which, which any player or leader can do, any points within the budget may be applied against specific players in the same state by the leader or by one player against another player in the same state. For each point expended and permanently lost, the target player's wealth may be reduced by that same amount, but no player may have their underlying wealth reduced to below one point. So it's a very crude system. Uh, you spend a point and you lose that point, but you reduce someone else's point also. And it's a very crude way of making them poor, but it also makes you poor. And it's basically a beggar thy neighbor uh, approach. It's meant to represent factories closing and throwing out their workers, and workers going on strike and reducing the productivity of a capitalist, and or two industries 
uh, basically engaged in ruthless price cutting competition which reduces their profits and so it's the type of non complementary uh, economic competition in a market uh, but it must be done within a state so class warfare has to be inside uh, its own state in step 10 there is domestic factor market factor endowment allocation so players may uh, allocate up to the total number of endowment points into their state's domestic market in rows 32 to 41 whose color uh, whose columns are color coded by country and so you'll see those here in in the rectangle indicated by domestic it's very easy to find uh, your um, particular uh, place in a country uh, such as 3b for example um, as a row and then you um, cross-reference that with the column that pertains to your country and you put in those values. You can see here all the uh, players in uh, country one, which are yellow, put all of their points uh, into domestics, a domestic market. Um, players that are in uh, the dark green have put nine points, which means they've got one point left over for foreign trade. The light brown has put eight, so they've got two points left for foreign trade. Blue's put six and so on. Countries like red and blue have put no points into their domestic market. Uh, countries like dark brown, uh, uh, country eight, have put 10 points, all of their points, into domestic, uh, the domestic market. In some ways, the domestic market is safer because you don't have to deal with uh, tariffs. Um, but negatively, um, uh, the growth rate is slightly lower. Um, because by staying to a domestic market, you're foregoing the advantages of specialization and comparative advantage that comes with international trade. The next uh, segment is the interstate trade factor endowment allocation. And players may allocate up to the total remaining number of endowment points into interstate trade. Now, this uh, procedure requires a few more steps uh, because of the way that the Excel file is structured. You first have to identify uh, your country of origin and that is done by looking at the state identifiers that are color coded on the left side so if you have state one it's yellow state two is light green uh, state three is light brown and then within there you identify your particular uh, position uh, let's say 5c and uh, you would then cross reference that with the color coding of the country that you're exporting to and if you were to uh, go down we have for example the leaf green state state 6 uh, player 1a has exported 4 to country uh, 2 which is uh, the dark green country and they've also exported 4 to the uh, light brown country uh, ignore the black columns those are either blockades or it's the country itself don't alter the numbers there uh, they're part of the calculation. The reason I show all the numbers is I want for those who want to be able to play around and run scenarios in order to maximize their profits, everything is transparent. The advantage of this kind of model is everything is transparent and while you may disagree with my particular valuations, uh, you can all, always alter it and make it your own and adjust it. But at least the rules of the game of how the market works are transparent for those that want to dig uh, more deeply. The next step, segment 12, is the gift uh, uh, factor endowment allocation. So here, it's the, the last box here. Here you would indicate on here uh, from what uh, what player, f um, uh, uh, rather you, you don't have to indicate what country you're from, you simply uh, indicate what country um, you're going to and what player you're targeting in that country. And you cross-reference those and put a value there and this value then gets inputted as a gift uh, uh, for uh, that player. Of course, uh, the total amount of money invested in class warfare and domest domestic uh, market allocations and in interstate trade allocations and gifting cannot exceed the total uh, wealth points that a player starts with in that turn. Once this is done, it's computed automatically and the professor will then copy and paste over that column and the game will then start uh, for the next turn. Now the table at the very top is a measure of dumping and it, uh, it, it can, you know, the players can learn how to read the table 
uh, which you can do by um, uh, investigating it. But it's meant for those that are more interested to calculate where they can maximize their profits by selling goods into a market that's not saturated. And this is difficult to do because players have a time limit to insert their values before the table is cut and pasted. And so they're probably going to be watching this table, at least the, the students that are more astute are going to be watching this table to try to figure out where it's best to invest their goods. It's basically like choosing to invest based on the values that are coming out of a stock market, which means interpreting fast moving uh, data. Now there are a couple of uh, calculations that are uh, indicated uh, in the rules themselves, uh, which I just want to go through uh, very quickly before talking a bit more about the underlying uh, logic of this overall game. So income uh, is the result of your domestic income divided by the dumping index, uh, plus gifts, plus the trade income uh, times a 10% uh, interstate trade advantage, times a 10% growth rate. So um, it assumes that the economies are naturally growing. So if if you have countries with fewer points, if rather if a player is losing points, then there's you know something seriously wrong with the economy unless uh, they're contributing heavily to the taxes. So if you look here, we now have the results uh, in turn one from the policies and the actions of turn zero. And you can see that player, uh, uh, the players in state one, which is yellow, each have a value of 9.6, which doesn't seem very fair. But actually, if you look at their budget, they've got 16. And so if you actually add that up, it's greater than what they started with. Uh, some countries are doing very poorly. Country eight, which is uh, dark brown, is got 1.1 value each. But if you look at it, they actually have a very large budget, which means uh, although the budget is not compensated, it means that they encountered uh, lots of tariffs which shifted wealth elsewhere. Uh, uh, yeah, And it's also, you can see a 0 0.5 here, which means that they were in some sort of disruptive uh, political event. Um, so you know, th these numbers would, well, the, it's not these numbers uh, in the middle uh, column that determine it, it's the numbers in the left column under the political system that determine these values. So you can see there's quite a variation uh, here I, I had the players behaving symmetrically uh, for many of the countries, but you can see some asymmetry because where I varied some of the values. And uh, uh, there are other countries that are doing poorly as well, like some of the players in uh, country nine, there's great variation within the country itself because players uh, there allocated their points differently. So this simulation is also meant to capture competition, not only between countries, but within countries and the complex types of relationships that occur between countries in an asymmetric fashion. The game starts off symmetrically. Um, every player has an equal uh, opportunity except that the first player in every country, player one, has political advantages and can choose the system. And from there we would expect, expect divergences um, between uh, different players. Now for domestic income, uh, it's the domestic investment times the governance system, times the economy of scale, times the productivity, which can be invested in, times one minus the tax rate, times a value of 20 divided by the scarcity index. The dumping index is a result of the total importation of a given factor plus 1,000 divided by the total of a given state factor plus a thousand. So exporting too many goods from too many countries into a single target country drops the value of that good because it's no longer scarce. Scarcity drives up the value. Too much of a good drives down the value. Now the economy of scale is calculated as one plus the total produced state factors divided by 10,000. So there, the economy scale is not a huge effect, but it uh, definitely has an effect that should be taken advantage of. Now scarcity is equal to the total produced state factors times 100 divided by the grand total of all state endowment factors. And trade income is equal to the sum of the individual export revenues. Now export revenue 
is equal to the specific endowment factor export investment times the target political system times the exporter productivity times the exporter economy of scale times 1 minus the tariff times 20 divided by the target scarcity. And finally, the budget is the export investment times the factor tariff rate plus the domestic income times the tax rate. So some notes on the design. Individual players represent capitalist elites and workers in a particular field of endowment and assume that these work as a cohesive interest unit rather than uh, disputations along class lines within that particular sector. The mechanism of determining the rate of return on a sold wealth point is on the basis of the assumption that the total wealth of a state is determined by its overall wealth, with rates of return increasing in response to the devi deviation of the economy from a balanced distribution of the five endowment factors. The more a state specializes in both of proportion and economy of scale in one factor endowment, the greater its rate of return. In other words, it pays in a state for some endowment factors, let's say the A's, to get more investment than, say, the D's. The greater the demand for a particular endowment in an export target state, the greater the rate of return minus tariffs, where in, uh, demand is determined by the extent of shortfall of the specific endowment with regard to its initial baseline share of 20%. The overall rate of return for a wealth point sold on the domestic market is also determined by the relative scarcity of that endowment factor. Players are encouraged to examine the spreadsheet to determine how profit is made. There's a slight advantage to engaging in international trade over purely domestic profit seeking, which is meant to capture the effects of international specialization and comparative advantage. So here are some of the simulation concepts, which are basically economic ideas that have been used by political science to explain political economy. The first is the uh, heckscher olin model of trade. So according to them, a state's comparative advantage is the result of its particular endowment of a combination of factors of production, specifically land, labor, and capital. Differences in endowments will create differences in comparative advantage. States will export products that require intensive application of the endowment the state has in abundance. This is comparative advantage in comparison with other states and will import factors that are scarce. This is sort of obvious. Countries try to buy and bring in what they need and they try to sell or get rid of what they have too much of. The Stolper Samuelson theorem argues that trade benefits actors possessing factors of production with which the economy is well endowed obviously because of the uh, economy of scale. If you have a lot of something in terms of production, you're able to reduce the unit costs because you're able to specialize through Taylorism or repetitive activities how something is produced. And this can result in political influence over market access policies. But it hurts those whose factors are scarce. So not everybody in economy benefits. Different endowment factors suffer depending on how the economy is structured. Export-oriented specialization leads to those factors being bid up and lowering demand for local, locally scarce factors. Political conclusion is that owners of abundant factors will seek greater trade openness and owners of scarce factors will seek protectionism. So this largely tries to predict which players in a country are going to demand higher tariffs and which are going to demand lower tariffs. Now, the specific factors model. Factors are relatively immobile. I mean, if you're growing food in a, in a farm field, that farm field cannot be picked up and moved somewhere else. Mines cannot be relocated. This model argues that different interest groups representing factors may band together for a common political policy, such as workers and industry banding together for protectionism. Incomes of factory owners are tied to exports do well, whereas owners of factors that must compete against imports do less well. Owners of export factors will seek open trade, and owners of other factors will seek protectionism. Now, direct foreign investment. The purchase and control of foreign assets. The free asset movement increases overall welfare of the system, but there are losers. Now, in this particular system, we don't have a simulation for direct foreign investment. 
although it's sort of incorporated in the export model. But players here are not free to take their wealth points and invest them into other countries to get a rate of return. Uh, portfolio investment is capital flows between states, and this is also not represented in the model. So factor behavior. The import of capital will reduce the return on capital of local investors. Local owners of capital will resist the influx of capital. Workers benefit from employment in manufacturing, so they welcome foreign capital. Increases in the franchise tend to empower urban workers who prefer more open policies for trade, immigration, and investment exported to labor and capital abundant states. But they also seek protectionist policies in labor and capital scarce economies. Proportional representation, meaning larger national coalitions, result in less protectionism, therefore, because they have far less of an impact than a plurality system, which is more particularist, which results in more protectionism. Autocratic regimes are better able to resist protectionism and maintain open economies, obviously because they can resist large segments of the population that are looking for economic protection. Exchange rate controls. Stability, or fixed exchange rates, versus policy control, which are floating exchange rates. Instability leads to inflation. Stability gives the state the inflation rate of the other country. So fixed rate preferences are typically the export of foreign direct investment or goods. Uh, fluid exchange rate preferences are those that compete with imports that want greater state influence over monetary policy labor and domestic manufacturers. Now a key observation of the simulation is that the basis for the creation of wealth is stability. And uh, this is one of the uh, conclusions that players will encounter uh, pretty uh, early on.